is this going to work in Asia? I mean, how easy is it to uh, plug this kind of technology is still in the developmental phase into into the grid out here uh, Michael is this something that can work in in China in uh, Japan or uh, Southeast Asia you bet in fact if you're looking at the statistics right uh, the energy demand is going to double globally over the next about two decades or so so in a massive increase right and if you look where most of that's going to come from it is in the Asian geographies so absolutely. So we've been thinking about that. And the entire backdrop of TE has been not just a research project to get to net energy, but one that's practically translatable and scalable into what the demand's going to require. So building something that's economic, that's safe, that's practical to use, and that's scalable quickly, in particular in resource or infrastructure starved parts of the world. So Asia is a prime target, and absolutely, it can plug in and deliver electrons and we hope we'll be able to do that by sometime uh, starting commercially in the 2030s. Michael, uh, Martin here, let me quickly jump in. I want to take a step backwards to give viewers a uh, sort of context uh, in case they're getting kind of lost uh, in all this. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, right? Commercial applications, uh, power generated by nuclear, almost all of that exclusively is fission which is being able to split a, a nucleus, right? What you're talking about is almost a holy grail, uh, right? It's fusion, which is uh, forcing two nuclei together to generate enormous amounts of uh, power. Am I correct here? Absolutely. In fact, it's exactly okay. what the sun does. Right? I mean, we all live off that energy and of that process. The universe is permeated by energy coming from fusion. So taking a hint from nature, this is the preferred way of making it. And exactly as you said, it's actually fusing atoms together, light atoms, yeah. and releasing Einstein's famous formula out of energy in the process. Indeed, right? And, and therefore, that is why it is the Holy Grail, simply because it's, it's not easy to do. And in fact, conversely, it's extremely hard to do. You mentioned this a couple of times, Michael, that uh, soon you're going to be able to get more power out than you have to put in. And that's the key thing with fusion. Yes, it takes an enormous amount of energy to make those two nuclei collide and generate power. I've seen some estimates it's about 10 billion degrees Celsius. I mean, that's how hot things have to get in order for, for fusion uh, to occur. Your, I guess, differentiating factor here is uh, the, the power that you used generated by hydrogen boron. Uh, I, I guess it, 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 it makes it happen. Uh, but I think the, the key thing is it's more cost effective as well as greener. Is that right? Yeah. So number one is, I mean, temperature is astronomical, right? The sun operates about 15 million degrees. Terrestrial, we have to use about 100 million degrees to billions of degrees, as you said. So there's a challenge there. What makes it hard also makes it very safe. In contrast to what you mentioned earlier, fission, you know, fission is this thing sort of a pact with the devil. Once you make it, it's hard to stop it, right? Here, it's hard to keep it going. So what's, what's precluded humanity from getting there is it's not just heating it up, but then holding it there. And so we're very close to achieving the ability to hold at will and then getting more energy out than we put in. And hydrogen boron in particular is interesting because it, it, it is ubiquitous in the world. There is no sort of uh, localized source in one place. It's all, all over. It's in seawater. It's acro across the crust. And when you burn it, you get helium. There's no radioactivity involved. There's no resource constraint. It really is the nirvana of energy once we, once we have this working. 